Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, dear guests and artists attending online, ich freue mich sehr, Sie heute Abend hier begrüßen zu dürfen und durch den Abend führen zu können. Looking forward to welcome you this evening and guide you through this evening. My name is Dr. David Schöne. I'm the director of the Kunsthaus Dahlem here in Berlin. And if you haven't been there, then please feel welcome to visit it. It's a building with its headquarters in an area that kind of fits very well to tonight's topic, which is why we're here today. It's the former studio of the sculpture Anna Brika, so a location where the National Socialists wanted to internalize themselves with art propaganda, and so we try to counteract this leg legacy of this building, and we do that with artists that we want to promote or artists that were persecuted or killed and forgotten, several thousands of artists and intellectuals were driven to exile if they were able to escape the National Socialists, which is why this evening, because of its topic, is extremely important for me and I think for everyone, for every one of us exile today and in the past. When do we talk about exile? When do we talk about evacuation? When do we talk about emigration? And we hope that this evening will contribute to us being able to look at the granular differences between these different terms, or at least have an opportunity to think about these differences. So in the beginning, I will talk about how we will proceed. My, I have my smartphone next to me. Usually, I will turn it off. But because I really need to look at the time very strictly tonight, I left it next to me. But now, let me introduce the people to my right and to my left, because I have fantastic speakers with me on stage today. To your left, to my right, we have Dr. Martina Weinand, historian. She used to be the officer for cultural legacy at the Foundation Stadtmuseum here in Berlin. And she was in charge of the legacies of artists and the dependent foundations in this house. And she also works on different projects. And because, and she also works at a edited version of Jean Manon's letters, apart from many different things that she is working on. And to my left, to your right, we have Ifinia Rilenko, usually from, originally from Kiev, now Berlin, curator for artistic projects. She's currently working at the Kunsthaus Dahlem as a curator, and she did a, or curated a fantastic exhibition to Bernhard Heidegger, but also was involved in several exhibitions since she arrived in Berlin in spring last year. So her, you know, sometimes critical view of our program, but also with regard to the history of art in general was extremely enriching for us and still is. So, and both of these will guide you through tonight's program. So we will go back and forth between history and contemporary happenings due to this pair of people that we chose. So we always, we chose sequences, Julia Kerr and Ina Vorowitz, painter Anja Annabes and Olena Dombrowska, the dancer Valenda Skat Gerd and theatre producer and Evgenia, could you please pronounce the name? Stas Jirkov. I really tried to learn how to pronounce his name properly. I really, really tried. So we agreed to listen to your questions after these three pairs of artists just because we don't, we have a lot of respect for this topic and we don't want to have a too heated discussion, but, you know, maybe keep your question in mind or write it down on the napkins that you had from the pretzels. But then after these uh, three artistic pairs, we will have a dance performance and afterwards we will have some snacks and then we can also talk about this topic again because sometimes it takes a bit of time to digest this information before you can really talk about it. Now, you know, an evening such as the one tonight doesn't just work because I'm here as a host or because my co-hosts are here on stage with me and they provide a great introduction 
to this topic, but because we have a real cohort of technical wizards, because we have three artists or two artists who are here with us virtually. We also have um, uh, three, excuse me, we also have interpretation into German and English. And which is why I would like to thank Therese Laux for all of her patience and all of the organizers of this team. She, you know, said in a loving way earlier that we're like a bag of fleas, but I would also like to thank the organizers of the Days of Exile. And now I would like to hand over to my very estimated colleague, Dr. Martina Weinland. Thank you very much. And welcome, dear audience, welcome to this very important topic. Exile is an experience which, if I, you know, have a look around in this room, someone must have, you know, realized that I or have experienced it either because you know, that you're, when you were younger, your friends, you had friends who had to escape because they had to flee, but also maybe because of your history or your past, you know, maybe sometimes members of your families had to escape or had to flee, you had to say goodbye to them because of the political situation. And I chose very carefully three protagonists who are Jewish, and their immigration happened during the NS regime. We have Julia Kerr, who is a lot more well known for her mother as Judith Kerr, who wrote this family trilogy. So when Hitler stole Pink Rabbit, which was turned into a movie by Caroline Link three years ago, and then also the two other volumes in that family trilogy. But who was her mother? Who was Julia Kerr, born in 1898 in Berlin, West End? She comes from a well-to-do family. So who was this woman and what did she expect from her life? So we know her as the second wife of the former very of Alfred Kerr, very, formerly very popular theatre critic, and his walks, his Spaziergänge, have been newly published. So, if you want to learn more about Berlin's history, then I would really recommend Alfred Kerr's walks or Spaziergänge. So he was born in 1870. 76, and they married in 1912, and he was 53 years at the time, and Julia Weismann, that was her maiden name, was 22 years old, so there was a big gap in age. She was also the favorite daughter of her father, Robert Weismann, and Robert Weismann himself was two years younger than his son-in-law. So, you know, you can see that just because of that fact, they didn't really like each other very much. Julia Kerr was someone who felt very drawn to music and, you know, often there is a bit of, uh, you know, commonalities between mathematics and music that seems to be a combination that a person who is very musical can understand very well. And so between 1916 until 1920, she, she, she got taught mathematics and she also studied music under Wilhelm Klatze. So on the German island of Rügen, you know, as a well-to-do family from Berlin, that's where they did vacation. So that's where she got to know Alfred Kerr. And he was very famous at the time for his theater criticism. And also, he had just lost his wife. He met his childhood sweetheart. And during the Spanish flu, which happened in Berlin here in 1919, he lost his young wife and their unborn child. So he had already had a lot of very sad experiences. And so Julia seemed you know, full of energy and, you know, full of optimism and joy of life. 
And so people who lived at the same time described him as someone who was, you know, funny and very interesting. He knew a lot of things and he was, it was so easy to get him excited for certain topics, just as Julia, they made a very good couple emotionally, but also intellectually. And that also shows that after the wedding that the parents didn't agree to in 1921, the son, the son Michael was born, and in 1923, Judith Kerr, the author that I mentioned earlier. So due to these family relations, which were kind of aggressive, you know, we also have the legend that the father, Weissmann, sent a group of, you know, people who were supposed to beat up his son-in-law, and in 1924, Julia tr attempted suicide for the first time, but that wasn't her first attempt at suicide because due to these different things that happened to her, she did it three more times, but she was luckily never successful. Julia was a musician and a composer, and at the time, the broadcasting industry was just in its beginnings, but 1928, in 1928, the German broadcasting company here in Berlin broadcasted her first opera, and she chose a poem by Eduard Mörike as the basis, Die Schöne Lau in German, and this opera, which she composed when she was only 30 years of age, was the first one that was broadcast as a premiere by the German broadcasting company, so that's a great achievement. And she, there was also a premiere in Schwerin. Unfortunately, there is no record, recording, audio recording of this broadcast at the time, and otherwise I would have shown it to you. But you have to just realize that Julia was really on the path to becoming a great composer. Alfred also, so her husband supported her where he could, and there was a second opera called Chronoplan, and he, her husband, wrote the libretto for that opera, so kind of a crazy story where George Bernard meets Lord Byron thanks to a time machine, and Albert Einstein would meet Isaac Newton, so kind of a crazy story that she came up with, but in 1933, after the National Socialists took power, Alfred Kerr was immediately on the list of undesired people, so everyone actually would have been able to just um, arrest him or denounce him and would have received a reward. And later on, he also, his German nationality was revoked, but by that time he had already left the country for a long time. And one and in the beginning of February, he went to Prague to safety. But that also meant that Julia or Julia only had two weeks to kind of take care of their affairs in Berlin and to travel to meet up to meet their husband together with their two young children. And that's really when her time in exile started. And we can summarize it as follows. Since the Nazis came, we don't really belong anywhere anymore. We moved from country to country. Everything was against us. Everyone was against us. And Julia, all of a sudden, was responsible to earn money for her family because Alfred Kerr was a German writer, a German theater critic. He could speak Ger French quite well, but he wasn't able to speak English at all. And in August 1933, France already began to send many of the exiled people back to Germany, so the family didn't have any choice but to emigrate to London. Julia spoke English rather well, and was able to take on smaller jobs in the beginning as a secretary and was able to feed her family with these smaller jobs. But you also have to imagine it. You know, you have to imagine that the family lived in smaller apartments in the beginning, but then especially when they were in London, they were accommodated in very cheap refugee hotels and sometimes 
you know, both Judith and her brother Michael had to be taken to foster families because there wasn't enough money for them to stay with their parents. Here you can see the drawings which Judith Kerr did for her book When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit. And on the top right-hand corner, you see her family. Judith is in the middle. Julia is on the right-hand side. And in 1945, so two years before they received British nationality. So this picture is was taken of them in England. So in 1942, Julia's father died, who she loved dearly. First, her parents were in Nice, and later on, they immigrated to the US. And the last time she saw her parents was in 1939. That is also part of this kind of exile experience, that families are being torn apart and are separated, and that it's also difficult to keep in touch with your family members, because even a stamp that costs eight pence, you know, still ha still had to be somehow paid for with the very little money that they had. So this portrait of Julia Kerr was made by Judith Kerr, and this was kind of the moment where Julia suddenly, after the end of the Second World War, had the feeling that she would be able to start a new life. So she went back to Germany together with the Americans, kind of like a victor, victorious. That's how you did care describe the whole situation. Now, really, she actually worked as an interpreter for the Nuremberg trials. And because of that, she went to Munich, Nuremberg, and Berlin with these different jobs. And thanks to her good relations to the Allied forces, in 1948, Alfred Kerr was invited to go to a lecture series in Hamburg. But he suffered a stroke in Hamburg, and he wasn't able to speak anymore. And he was almost in a coma for about three weeks. And the two of them had agreed before that if one of them would be in this kind of situation, that the other person would help them die. And that's what Julia did because, yeah, and by doing, by giving him certain an overdose of medication. And at the time, she had already found a new love, a Jewish lawyer who first during the Nazi period tried to survive here in the underground in Berlin, but then later on immigrated to England and went back with the Allied forces. And Walter Galewski, that was his name, and so she had a relationship with him and he kept on saying time and time and game that you know, that she was a very intense person, but that it can also be very tiresome. In 1956, there were these, you know, trial, compensation trials. Nothing really happened. Things felt kind of stuck. And so that meant a huge burden for the people who survived. And then she attempted to commit suicide for the fourth time. And Judith writes about that in one of her books. And after Julia woke up from her coma, she apparently said that, so if I had died, at least I would have known where I'm at. And Judith writes, well, my mother didn't really realize the kind of weird thing that she just said. But, you know, you could also say that she herself was seen by her friends and acquaintances as someone who was a romantic. So if Julia could only have accepted life the way that it is, if only she would have had the capability to make the best out of everything that would have been better than always being a romantic and rejecting everything that is not exactly the way she had dreamt it. And she herself said, I also would have loved to be different so that everyone would have taken care of me. 
Instead, I always had to take care of everyone else. And that is kind of the conclusion. <coughs> so, you know, in the beginning, she had this very hopeful career in music. And, you know, she wanted to revive Chronoplan in 1947, her sec second opera, but it didn't really work out the way she planned. But she had all of these talents, but she couldn't really fulfill all of these talents because of the situation and because she was an exile and had to take care of her family. On the 5th of October 1965, she died in Berlin very suddenly uh, while she was playing tennis and she had a heart attack and she is now at the Ostov Cemetery in Hamburg next to her husband, Alfred Kerr. Thank you very much, Martina. Now let's move to the present tense from a very to a very current situation and the opportunities of a musician, something that Julia Kerr didn't have. So we will, yes, she hopefully the music one day will be able to heard also in the future, and now I will hand over the microphone to Yevgenia. So first of all, um, hello, and I from myself also welcome you all here. And just a small introduction. When we started to talk about this event, we were thinking about how to present in a best way uh, artist from past and present. And of course, we decided that it would be very good to give the voice to artists like from contemporary, contemporary artists to give them voice and to let them talk themselves about their situation. And of course, our part, I think, will be very different from what Martina has and what she presented now, uh, to us now. Because uh, during our previous conversations with the participants, we realized that we don't have answers for so many questions that we have now. And at the end of the day, we can say that those artists who passed away now, they found some answers on their questions. And we are all in the process of writing them down. And the history is ongoing. We are writing this history now. So I will give a small presentation of each and every participant, and then we will talk a bit. So the first participant is Inna Vorobets. She's a flautist. She was born in Lviv and started to play flute at 10 years of age. Uh, she got bachelor's and master's degree in flute performance at the Lviv Music Academy and then a supplementary master's degree in contemporary music at Jerusalem Academy of Music and Dance with Professor Haga Shagal. And during her later studies, she performed together with contemporary music group Metal Ensemble in Jerusalem, Israel. Since 2013 and um, before joining the very well-known in Ukraine Ucho Ensemble as, as a participant flautist, Ina was a piccolo player in Lviv Symphony, Symphony Orchestra. And from 2019 and until 2021, she was also working as the principal flautist of the Kiev Symphony, Symphony Orchestra. Um, Ina was awarded with several scholarships, scholarships and prizes and performed in various venues as a soloist and chamber musician with different groups, music groups. And um, 
before the full-scale invasion, she got an invitation from the Poznan Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra. They offered her to join them and offered her a contract. And I would like to ask Ina to tell about her actually accidental uh, evacuation and accidental exile. Um, yes, um, it was, um, my story is, uh, is uh, a bit different because um, uh, I, I uh, left Ukraine four days before the war and uh, I didn't plan to, to stay in Poland for a long time and uh, I just I got invitation to participate in the final round auditions in the Poznan Philharmonic Orchestra and um, the plan was to go there for several days of rehearsals, play concert and return back. This was the initial plan and but obviously uh, I remember my uh, uh, mood uh, in the um, in this time um, it was 20th of February, four days before the actual invasion. And I remember that uh, I got this feeling that uh, um, some, some, uh, it's kind of intuitive feeling that uh, um, you, 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 will not, you will not return back. There was something in the air telling that, uh, are you sure that you will really return back? And, um, but um, I went, went to Poland on the 20th of February um, and um, it was one of the last flights as, uh, as we got known later. And um, I remember uh, on the 24th uh, of uh, February when the actual invasion uh, started, uh, I remember that uh, uh, that uh, orchestral uh, um, rehearsal when you are coming with uh, different sauce to rehearsal uh, because what happened before that you're waking up in the hotel uh, because of the phone calls from your parents from your uh, friends telling you that um, the war started and uh, how you will return back uh, so yeah I um, Maybe in the beginning I told that my story is different, but um, I know also um, a lot of stories of people like uh, like uh, like mine that they were coming for um, they they were coming to uh, as for example the Ukrainian writer Oksana Zabushko. She went she went to Warsaw also a few days before the war and uh, with the same uh, small cabin. Uh, cabin uh, um, luggage and she had to stay for longer so I understand that it's a uh, not unique story it's uh, this kind of stories you can hear a lot but um, in my case yes it was um, it was a um, kind of a, a, a by accident I uh, um, I um, I was invited in this time of the in this time of the month for this kind of project and um, and, and yeah this is how it worked for me so now I'm uh, from from the 20th February of 2022 uh, until now I'm uh, living and working uh, with Poznan Philharmonic and um, um, I haven't been in Ukraine since yet. Um, Luckily, I can talk with my uh, family um, by phone, uh, but um, and but I haven't seen uh, some some of my family, some people from my family. And what was the process of taking that decision? When we talked, uh, you told me that a few days you had to like you had a few days to decide and did you think during those time to go back to Ukraine or what was going on? Yes, uh, I had to make a quick decision because uh, on the 24th of February um, 
uh, I came to the rehearsal hall and uh, I had a conversation with the director and the main conductor and uh, they, um, they started telling me that it's a final round audition, there is this situation, you don't know, um, you don't know uh, how you will return, so we want to offer you a contract. Um, and um, uh, I told them, okay, I'm, I'm obviously happy to hear that because this is, what, this is what I initially wanted to do. That's why I played audition one year before. But uh, um, it's uh, it's, a decision, it's not a just simple decision you have to take. It's a decision to to change the country, to change everything, to um, to enter a new also orchestral family. And um, you don't know if, if it will work for you or not, but uh, and, and they give me uh, they give me one, one uh, day to to think about this. Uh, obviously, it was uh, it was uh, it wasn't uh, an easy decision, but with the help of my uh, uh, family and uh, colleagues, we had discussion that it's now it's better place to stay. Uh, because it's a safe place and uh, you will be able to continue uh, your main activity uh, in, um, in Poznan to play in the orchestra uh, and, um, and then you can decide later. So it's not like, it's not a decision you have to take forever, right? And, uh, but um, I'm very happy that I took this decision because uh, um, so I, I really, I had nothing with me. Uh, I came from Kyiv having only one pair of concert shoes, uh, concert outfit, and, uh, and that's it. And uh, when I uh, decided to, when I uh, made a decision to stay, I, was, I, uh, um, I never feel a need in anything because uh, um, uh, everyone from the orchestra, the, the inspector of the orchestra, he was calling almost every day, making a health check or how do you feel, maybe you need something and uh, maybe you, you need some food, like uh, everything. Uh, also the director of the orchestra, uh, I also remember an uh, interesting story that in the day of the concert, on the 25th, so when there was the second day of the invasion, I remember one uh, viola player and she brought me uh, a bread uh, uh, which she uh, baked by herself, and it was like uh, in in this uh, very um, um, in this very uh, um, uh, um, uh, material uh, wrapped in the material. But it was something uh, I was really um, I was pleasantly shocked by this uh, empathy I met there and. Uh, uh, and by the attention I got there, so um, I, I understand uh, totally that I was under shock there, um, as though I could play and it helped me a lot, um, but um, yeah, it, it was a decision that I had to, uh, to take very quickly. Just a short comment about the process of taking the decision. Also, I know a lot of people who are living like here or somewhere around so they are living abroad and they still uh, they don't want to say that they took the decision to stay that's something temporary for them and like Farina she told that she took that, that decision but a lot of people they continue to live in this unstable yeah I, I didn't decide yet I don't know maybe tomorrow everything will will be finished and I will go back. Um, also, I wanted to ask how all these circumstances, um, like you told me that you got, yeah, you got a lot of support and you got very good technical equipment and so on and so on, but how these circumstances influenced you? Um, yes, I, uh, as I told before, I got almost everything I needed uh, um, in the same uh, in this orchestra. I got a new instrument which I could only dream about. It's a, uh, it's a very good flute uh, I, um, uh, which, which I can use in my job. And um, um, what I can uh, tell by certain that this change 
um, this change in in location, this uh, uh, change um, in 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 life, because it's very radical change. Um, it changed a lot. So you have you just have to start a new life. You have to accept it and um, uh, accept the new reality and um, and work there but uh, what didn't change uh, for me it's uh, luckily it's that i didn't have to um, to um, change a direction of my work so for starting from 2013 i was an orchestra musician and uh, now i have this um, uh, preference this possibility to uh, also to be an orchestra musician here in poland and um, uh, but uh, if to talk about the change, I think I'm truly convinced that if you change, there is this radical 100% um, change in your life, it also affects the way you are playing. So I wouldn't say the direction of my activity changed because I'm, I'm working in the orchestra, but um, I think my, my playing also changed and uh, the way I'm working in the, in the orchestra I also remember um, this uh, the, the very um, first project in the orchestra. Uh, I remember I um, uh, I didn't work that uh, that well because of the um, I think I was too much in, uh, under anxiety, and um, it was kind of the first projects were very stressful for me. I couldn't really concentrate normally, and I think it was. Quite also hard for for the partners in the in the orchestra group to collaborate, but they didn't tell me that. They just support me a lot, and uh, um, I remember one uh, one rehearsal when conductor told me some uh, kind of uh, comment, and the colleague near me told me, "Oh, I don't know, don't tell her anything because she's uh, she is new or something." So she wa he wanted to. To, to to make it in this kind of cocoon um, so I will not be distracted by any other comments but um, I think with the because I'm here for more than a year and a half and I think with this more I became settled more I uh, um, uh, more I became used to this new reality and new contacts and also to ex accepting this and uh, and trying to help uh, myself mentally also more it's uh, the way of my playing also changes and um, uh, I can I can feel it uh, from the feedbacks of colleagues and uh, I think it took me some time it really took me some time um, to to settle uh, and to work on the on the mental uh, on the mental uh, aspect yeah, and once uh, I would like to add that once uh, Ina told very interesting phrase that it feels like uh, somebody took me out of the roots, like me already a mature old three, and just simply transplanted. And that feels really, really unnatural. And that's why sometimes even with all these good circumstances and all this support, you just feel an anxiety and yeah it took time to uh, stand up again yeah it feels like exactly feels like it felt like in the beginning that your um, your tree with all this uh, with all these roots and roots uh, you can uh, inter you can interpret how you want it family it's uh, friends it's a contact also you can you're using in your career starting from the school where you started playing or start uh, continuing in academy where you met your professors for example okay. so this is a room and in yeah, one yeah. Um, in, a, in this moment yeah we have to uh, stop because we are running out of time thank you. Yes. but yeah thank you so much you. and we will come back to you during the q a session thank you thank Good. you very much Ina. um this bar wie ein, ein ganz ähm, ja, bewegendes Schlaglicht in die Jetztzeit, 
Und ich glaube, die wenigsten that können was sich an extremely moving wie, excursion into the present, and I think only a very few of you can imagine um what it is to travel somewhere with just your carry-on luggage, with just one outfit, and all of a sudden, you know, having to stay there for a longer period of time, and that also obviously involves so much suffering as well, and horrible experiences. Now I would like to move on to the second pair, Annie Albers. Mund und den Worten meiner Kollegin. And my colleague will talk about her now. Ja, Anni Albers hat gesagt, Annie Albers 1968 in einem Interview in mit dem Smithsonian in Museum, with the mindestens Smithsonian einmal Museum, im Leben ist at least es gut, once bei Null anzufangen. It is good to start from zero. Das ist ein gewaltiger Ausspruch für jemanden, der 1899 was born in 1899 in Berlin Mother, Toni Ullstein, came from a very long-standing German publishing family, the Ullstein publishing family, and her father had a very successful furniture manufacturing shop. You know, being born in such a wealthy family and in a family that is also very culturally well-versed means that Annie, well, another important aspect for her is that she, from her birth on, had neurological problems in her feet and legs, and that also means that she wasn't able to walk well as a kid. She had three siblings. And, you know, in this family, she always had a kind of a special role because of the fact that she wasn't able to walk normally. And during her life, she had a bit of a difficult relationship with her mother, even though Toni Fleischmann really tried to figure out Annie's wishes and also fulfill her to fulfill what she wanted to do and from a very from her very childhood onwards she wanted to become a painter so we're still in the Wilhelminian era in Germany and that meant that women weren't allowed to study art for instance, you could go to Lien, like Paula Modersohn Becker, or 1905, Kete, Becker, uh, Kete Kollwitz, to go to yeah, a private university, a private school, or you could look for a renowned artist who could be a teacher. And interestingly enough, for Annie Albers, it turned out to be Martin Brandenburg, an artist who today has almost been forgotten, but at the time, he was a symbolist and was very important for the painting circles of Berlin together with Liebermann, for instance. He worked very closely with Liebermann. And she also wanted to go to Oskar Kokoschka, who at the time lived in Dresden and also taught in Dresden. So she wanted to be his pupil. And so her mother went with her to Dresden. But in 1919, Kokoschka didn't want to accept Anneliese Fleischmann, who at the time was 20 years old, as a student. And so she went to the School for Arts and Crafts in Hamburg. In 1919, the monarchy ended and the Weimar Republic was announced or proclaimed. And so there are so many new projects and so many new residential buildings and also new reform pedagogy and, you know, reform houses. And in 1919, of course, there's also the Bauhaus that was founded by Walter Kropius in Weimar. And the importance that Bauhaus then later had, so from 1919 until it was closed in 1933, is immense and it's impossible to really gauge how important this 
was. So many people wanted to go there, and you know there was a very special kind of teaching style. And Paul Klee, who was a bit of a you know hermit, also taught there as well as Vasily Kandinsky and Annalisa Fleischmann. You know, so because things didn't really work out with her painting, she tried to sw or switch to Bauhaus, and because of her slight disability, you know, that she couldn't really walk, she was accepted by Walter Kropius, but not to glass ceramics and also not to the painting school, but she went to the, she, she went to the weaving school, so to the loom. And uh, later on, she went to the Black Mountain College after she was in exile. But you know, her weaving, so really this craft, very manual work was seen at the time as very female, as, as a very female thing to do. And at the time, initially, she wasn't very comfortable with it. But there was a young artist, Josef Albers, who you know, had a great career and he was a very experienced student and then a very young teacher later on and in May, May 1925, they married, they got married and from that moment onwards, it is also clear for Annie that she wants to continue weaving and that she was able to, yeah, live her creativity through her weaving. You all know who Annie Abbas is because she's now one of the most famous textile artists of the 20th century. But up to that point, it was a long path. Only in 1930, she received her Bauhaus diploma. And in 1931, she received the award of the city of Berlin here at the German construction exhibition, the Bauausstellung, and also um, the successor of Walter Kropius, she also managed to weave a very decorative curtain, and that was a great challenge to weave that curtain. They also used plastic fibers, for instance, and combined that with traditional kind of weaving materials. And that was also one of the things that she was really good at. She didn't just want to weave ornaments that were aesthetically pleasing, but she also wanted to be innovative from a technical point of view in her discipline. So in 1924, Bauhaus had to, the Bauhaus had to close in Weimar after the National Socialists took over the state parliament in Thuringia and it found a new home in Dessau and Sachsen-Anhalt, but in 1932, the Bauhaus was also closed in that city, and Mies van der Rohe then later tried to open the Bauhaus for half a year, for six months here in Berlin, and keep it alive for a further six months, but then it was closed entirely, and you know, the people who used to work there were unemployed, but thanks to all of their international linkages and networks, the teacher at Bauhaus had contacts to international architects. And so Philip Johnson, for instance, is in con was in contact with all of the colleagues from the Bauhaus. And thanks to him, Josef and Ali Ani Albers were taken to or emigrated to the US in 1933. They were able to teach at the Black Mountain College in North Carolina. And that, of course, made it a lot easier for them to emigrate also pretty soon after. So in 1939, they received American citizenship, which is a very important fact because Anis family, so her, you know, with the name of Fleischmann, still resided in Berlin and couldn't leave. In 1937, her parents are able to flee via Mexico, and in 1939, so the year in which they received American citizenship, her sister and her brother were also able to join them in the U.S. Now, on this photo, we can see that there were also, they had friends who were already in the U.S. who supported them, for instance, the family Dreyer, and this photo was taken in their car, and together with 
them. They traveled, for instance, to Mexico, and they were really fascinated by that because of these archaic textile, archaic textiles, and also these archaic graphs that were dominated by graphs and triangles and other geometrical forms. And this was a great inspiration for her own work. After Josef Albers had a fight with the teachers at the Black Mountain College, they went to New Haven in Connecticut, so they moved there, and Josef taught at Yale University and was the director of the art department. And Annie, I don't know if it's because she didn't receive any offers or because she's becoming more and more Puritan and doesn't want to waste her time, because as she said herself, art is everywhere, and every diversion from your work is a waste of time. And so this is really her principle. And so she then became a freelance textile artist and she's also, or she was very interested in technical progress and developments. And so she started a cooperation with the international agents, with, uh, with Florence Knoll, we all know Knoll furniture, this very high quality, inter quality interior, and, you know, of course, Annie Alves with her weaving techniques and with her patterns, with her designs, she had, or she was able to do, deliver or design the corresponding decoration for this high quality furniture. So after this cooperation, she received a lot of jobs from the Jewish community, in fact, for instance, in 1966, she received the, she was supposed to design a tapestry for the Holocaust Memorial, six prayers, two times three meters. And this was weaved, of course, but from the time, actually, she doesn't weave anymore. She was already at the beginning of her 60s, and she had some physical impairments. In 1977, the couple, so Josef and Annie Alves, meet Maximilian Schell, and in 1962, he made a movie about the Nuremberg trials and received a lot of awards for it, but he was also a bit of a difficult person. That is to say, he, as he said himself, you know, I fund and direct my own movies rather than trying to dance to someone else's tune. And they meet in 1976, in the beginning of March, and on the 25th of March, 1976, Josef Albers unfortunately passes passed on. Then Maximilian Schell then becomes the second big love in Annie Albers' life. She um, really, she loves him greatly even, and they unfortunately then have a bit of money difficulties because of course he wants to fund his movies and the works of Albers, Josef Albers already were had a very high value at the time, you know, in the six-digit kind of um, dimension. And so Ani well, took delight in giving Maximilian one of Josef's paintings for his birthday so that from the proceeds he'd then be able to fund his film projects. And I would really recommend to uh, recommend Nicolas Fox Weber, who was a good friend of Annie Albers, and he accompanied her. And Maximilian Schell invited her to Salzburg for his stagings of the Jedermann, Every Man. And this is very interesting, this book, uh, when you're interested, if you're interested in Annie Albers, and you can learn a lot when you read that book about her. Now, Nicholas Fox Weber, in these many, many conversations that he had with her, also summarized the following. 
Annie, Annie Albas felt that only through art could she find, would she be able to survive the whims of human existence. She was convinced that forms of our own imagination offered protection from disease, inflation, war, social unrest, and other realities that were beyond our control. She died in 1994, so she really died at a very old age, and her largest success was after she emigrated to the U.S. So I would call her the disciplined one, in contrast to Julia Kerr, who was more the unhappy one. Thank you very much, Martina. I don't know if Olena's works have already or already sold as well that they can co-fund or entirely fund entire film productions, but they're, you know, still as beautiful. And I don't know if she is disciplined. Someone else would have to assess that. But she has a very different perspective to, to on today's life. So, um, first of all, to make it, uh, to, to not make our moderator more nervous, uh, we are really not strict in time. Uh, and with Lena, we have to talk in Ukrainian, and then I have to translate it to you. That's why the part of her story I will tell myself. Uh, Lena, я кажу, що з твого дозволу, аби скоротити час, uh, я перекажу частину твоєї історії, і потім ми зупинимося на головних питаннях, про які ми з тобою говорили. Uh, so, Lena is originally from Odessa, Ukraine, and during the last years before the full-scale invasion, she lived and worked in Kiev. And actually, Lena's experience is the example of experience of person who came back to Kiev, and she's now, but now you're Zaraz uh, Odessi, правильно? Now she's, exactly now she's in Odessa because she has an opening of her exhibition tomorrow. But she lives in Kiev. Um, she went uh, into evacuation and uh, was able to leave for a few months in a separate, uh, in, in different residence, uh, residentships uh, in Denmark and then in Austria. Um, and she, she actually has a classical uh, background and classical ac academic degree in monumental painting, but she became famous for her non-objective works, and some of them, you can see we printed them there. Maybe after the discussion, you can uh, go closer and have a look. Um, and it's it's actually I think an interesting connection with the previous protagonist because, yeah, uh, she worked with textile and Lena works a lot with lines and it's also something for me uh, a bit similar. Um, so. I would like to ask Lena because she came back and we already talked like how she decided to came back. And that's why I want to ask her exactly about her experience of residentships, because it's part of the answer. Uh, отже, Лена, я хочу, щоб ти розказала про свій досвід перебування в резиденціях, тому що, як я сказала, uh, цей досвід – це частина відповіді на питання, чому ти зрештою вирішила повернутися до України до, до завершення війни. Добрий вечір всім. Дякую за запрошення. Ну, перша моя резиденція була в Данії. Лена, я маю тебе перекладати. So, first of all, greetings to everyone. Uh, Lena is very ha happy to be here and to welcome all of you. And her first residentship was in Denmark, as I already told. Так, продовжуй. По-перше, я евакуювалася в Данію, тому що мене запросили туди друзі, які займаються також безпредметним мистецтвом. She decided to go to Denmark 
because she got an invitations, uh, invitation from friends who also work with uh, non-objective art. And for myself, I might say, because we worked with this community, it's a huge community of non-objective artists through all over the world. And so actually, Lena got a lot of opportunities at, and a lot of offers. Так. Uh, uh. Перш за все вони нам сказали, що ми, я приїхала туди з дівчиною, ще одною знайомою новою, і вони сказали, що у нас є два місяці для того, щоб, як це сказати, відпочити від війни, а потім ми повинні були працювати. So she went there and uh, another girl went there too. Um, and the residence residency owners told her them that they from now they have two months to relax and then they have to start working але приїхавши в Данію і взагалі в Європу де я була ну один раз може я відчувала просто дуже велике спустошення і Так, да, я відчувала спустошення, і в мене не було сил ні на що. Мені не було цікаво нічого. Я не хотіла працювати. So it, it was very, very hard to uh, motivate yourself to work because, yeah, after the stress, when she came to Denmark, she felt like emptiness inside, and yeah, it was really hard to, for her to find power to work. Uh, так, і, але ну, потім вони створили резиденцію, тому що це була, в них була резиденція. І ну, було дуже, дуже важко, тому що постійно відчувався тиск того, що ти повинен щось робити. За тобою слідкували, що, ти, що я повинна вставати, ну, там, вставати і постійно працювати. Але на це взагалі не було сил, і це ще більше, ну, якби, демотивувало взагалі щось робити. Це, по-перше. По-друге, в мене не було такої цілі, щоб залишитись. Моя, перш за все, мені потрібно було перебути десь в Європі, в резиденції, і я заповнювала інші заявки, щоб мати якісь, якісь кошти для проживання. So, yeah, it was... It was, it felt like a lot of pressure being there because um, they were both on the constant, like, gay, under the constant, constant gaze of uh, residency owners. Um, and she didn't want to stay actually somewhere abroad. Uh, for her, her main uh, goal to go to this residency was to like to have a safe space um, and that's why she applied for another residencies and that was not something that really liked the residency owners also um да потім я приїхала до Берліна, де мені потрібно було перечекати якийсь час, і я ще хочу, ну там, я ще подорожувала з своєю кішкою, і це також давало досить велику, велику кількість проблем, тому що е, в мене було два випадки, які я не хочу там заглиблюватись, коли мені потрібно було терміново і за кішки е, з'їжджати і шукати терміново щось знову. І це додавало ну, додаткового стресу, який було дуже важко пережити, тому що тільки що в тебе є де жити, і тобі треба вже їхати звідти. Але so, мені допомогли друзі з Берліна. Yeah, an additional я... stress... Дозволь мені перекласти, щоб я не загубилася. Uh, an additional stress was that Lena evacuated with her cat uh, and it was something yeah, she could not imagine to, to go abroad and to leave her pet uh, somewhere in, in Kiev. So she evacuated with cat and of course it causes a lot of troubles because not everyone will welcome you uh, in their apartment with a cat. 
And a small comment from myself, actually it was a big conversation between me and Lena about this residency experience, because it's really, I think, not only for Lena, but for a lot of artists, this residency experience was something that like really, really hard because you really, you're going there not because you're searching for something to, for the development in your style or for work. You really, in our case, we were trying to find a safe space. But of course, there are some rules and of course, residency owners have, have to um, pay for, for this space and they, yeah, they have their own rules. And sometimes it doesn't, it, and it didn't correspond to uh, the circumstances and to the mood that Ukrainian artist had and has. And so, uh, yeah, after this residency, uh, Lena had to uh, leave the residency before the time that was um, expected at the beginning. And she went to Berlin and then she went to another res residency in Austria. Тож я вже сказала, що далі ти поїхала в резиденцію в Австрії. Так, за ці півроку я була дуже виснажена цими постійними переїздами з речами. Я ще додам, що виїжджала я якби на два дні з Києва, а опинилась в Данії, потім в Німеччині. І вже коли опинилась в Австрії, в дуже хорошій резиденції з гарними людьми, я вже настільки була емоційно виснажена, що, що я, ну, я дуже хотіла додому. Да? І... So, yeah, after, after Lena came to the residency in Austria, she was already very, very exhausted with all the troubles. And even she got a very good, like, very good opportunities and the circumstances were very good. She realized that she is not able to work. І дозволь мені трошки переказати, бо знову ми вибиваємося з таймінгу. So she made a few works, but after that she realized that, yeah, that's, that's impossible pressure. And she told me that after she came back to Ukraine in October last year, she actually was not able and still is not able to work in the style she worked before. And now she even, she doesn't know if she will continue this work uh, in future, but now she's trying to work with video because the language, uh, her previous language, can't, she can't express herself with this language. And for her, it's a big question, what for? And I think, yeah, it's a question for a lot of artists. And now we have to, to finish this part and go to the next one. Дякую тобі дуже, Лено. Ми переходимо до наступної частини. Thank you very much, Olena, for sharing that. Um, es ist ein bisschen so, als würden uns diese zeitgenössischen Stimmen einen Eindruck davon geben, wie Exil auch in der Geschichte gewesen sein muss, weil es plötzlich so etwas Persönliches bekommt. Und ich möchte mit aller Zeitmahnung, Martina, um einen Einblick in Valeska Gerz Exilerfahrung und Lebenserfahrung bitten. Ja, also ich kann keinen Hehl daraus machen, das ist eine meiner... I would really like to tell you that this is one of my favorite Berliners. You have heard from Julia Kerr, who I would call the unhappy one. Then we heard about Annie Albers, the disciplined Berliner. And for Valeska Gerd, I would call her the uninvincible uh, personality. She was born in Berlin in 1892. And when she was seven years old, she already had dance lessons. Here's a photo of her. 
her mother. I mean, you've seen this on TV, I guess, that um, children are already pulled in front of the camera because the parents say, you have to become a star. But in the case of uh, Valeska Gerd, it was her own doings, it was her own plan and motivation. She said, the moment I'm on stage, I don't think anymore. I just concentrate and uh, the characters race out of me like rockets. The real becomes transparent. And Valeska Gerd from 1915 to 1916 during the First World War had uh, acting classes under Maria Mursi and Alfred Breiderhoff. And in 1918, she started as a solo dancer and already had performances in Berlin. She married Helmut von Krause in the same year. So that was during the first years of the NS regime where he protected her. And she had contacts to the Dada group like Raoul Hausmann or Hannah Hörch. She developed her own dance style and dance performances where she used collages and drawings, she used poems, onomatopoeia. And I think it is especially fascinating that her grotesque dances, as she called it, were showing scenes from everyday life. She would dance the traffic from Potsdamer Platz in Berlin, where we had the first uh, traffic lights, because there was so much traffic. And, or she danced cinema. She danced, for example, Pola Negri in one of her first films. She danced circus. And many times she did dances about sports, for example, the legendary boxing battles. And all these topics were part of the life of the metropole, as we call it, the, yeah, the crazy dance on the balcony. So it was also a Berliner who's famous for the 1920s and her art. She met this person and she made this portrait, you can see on the picture of her. It shows in a very particular way how her face expression, her facial expression looked like, with which she also worked on stage. She was also one of the actors who, one of the first actors in a, a, a film with sound. She was one of the first ones to be also broadcast same as Julia Kerr with her first opera and that was broadcasted. And from 1924 on, you could see her in different films, especially uh, Midsummer Night's Dream by Max Reinhardt. Maybe you've seen the Hollywood film in the 1930s, one of the most beautiful films where she played Puck who played a very important part next to Titania and Oberon. Yet she also played in People on Sunday, which is also a very classical film for Berlin. She is one of those people who went onto the local river. I mean, the people from Berlin know this movie. She was part of that movie. And in 1932, she opened her own cabaret, which was called Kohlkopp. And in 1933, she emigrates to London, where she marries Robin Anderson, who is an Englishman, in 1936. And in 1939, she manages to depart to New York. She had seven stops in her asylum 
journey. She went to, for example, in 1947, she finally came back to Europe because she had the authority to go back. And on 17th of February 1949, she's finally able to come back to Berlin. And it only takes her six months before she opens the cabaret called Cabaret called by Valeska in Berlin. And in 1950, she opens another cabaret because she had to close the other one down, which was called the Witch's Kitchen, Hexenküche. So in that time, in the 50s, a lot is happening in Berlin. People from other places come back, like Karl and Katja Merowski, who found together with Johannes Hübner, for example, another cabaret called Die Badewanne, the bathtub. On my way here, I went past the street where you saw that this old hotel, the Ellington Hotel from that time, where in the 20s this very famous bar was set up and where you had a very famous artist cabaret, the Badawana, the bathtub, which became later a different cabaret again. And Valeska Gerd, she had a tete-a-tete -tete with uh, another artist who have made it possible for her to leave the country again. And in the 50s, she's so annoyed by Berlin and she retreats to Kampen in Sylt, on the island Sylt. And this is where she opened another cabaret, which was called the Ziegenstall, which is the goat's den. And you could summarize it that you had very crazy looking uh, waiters that give the people, serve the people very bad food and it's very expensive. So, but it's very popular. And in, the in 1970, she receives the German Television Award. And that's where she also starts to work in film again. She works together with Fellini, like uh, Eight Hours Don't Make a Day, Juliet of the Spirits, or The Enchantment of the Blue Sailors. And two times she works with Volker Schlöndorf in Coup de Grasse on 1977. He makes a documentary about her life, which is called Just for Fun, Just for Play. She has said about her life, if I die one day, it will be lonely and you won't be able to find me. And that is exactly how it went, because she's found a week later after she died in 1978. She got to get 86 years old and she has been buried in an honorable grave in Berlin. And this is what she said about her life. I want to make theater and films with like-minded people to shape great destinies and play comic and funny pranks until I am 40 or 50. At 50, I want to be a director. At 60, a critic. And at 70, a counselor for unhappy and confused people. Life is wonderful. Uh, this is a great quote, and I think this kind of counselor is, does not exist yet for unhappy and confused people, but we will hear in a bit about it. So yeah, and we came to our <laughs> we came to our last participants, like last but not least. Uh, so Stas. He is a theater director. He was born in Ufa, Bashkortostan, but at the age of five, he moved with his family to Ukraine and since, since there, then uh, he lived there. 
uh, he started his directing career in 2011 and already in 2014, at the age of 27, he, he became a, an artistic director. First of the Golden Gate Theatre in Kiev and then uh, the theater, the Kiev State Drama and Comedy Theater on the left bank of the river Dnipro, or how we call it, just left bank theater. Um, and this last position he held until November 2022. Um, actually, when I was thinking about who to invite to this conversation, I really wanted to have a male gaze and a male position. And I thought about Stas because I saw he's one of the latest plays that was staged at Schaubühne, Berlin. And it called to take arms against a sea of troubles. That is a quote from Shakespeare. And that was a, that was a play uh, when they were trying to research and to tell the stories about artists who decided to go to the front line, to go to the front, and also about artists who decided to not to do so. And a few more words about Stas, that he's a multiple winner of a different theater awards and international festivals, and the most, I might say, active um, director, Ukrainian di director abroad today. He already staged more than 40 plays and about 50 of them is where, where in Europe, Germany and Lithuania. And yeah, I would like to ask you to tell us about like how did you evacuate it uh, and how actually when we are talking about uh, men now, usually people think that it's someone who escaped, who didn't want to go to the front and they are like, they are not able to come out from the country and they are not able to go back to the country. And since your story is a bit different, I would like you to ask, I would like to ask you to tell us about it. Hello to everyone. First of all, thank you for the possibility to be in such a great company, in such a great place, uh, even online. And uh, on 24th of February, me and my family, which is my wife, my son and my dog, had a ticket... Uh, had a tickets for the for the traveling to Vilnius to Lithuania because on 24th of February my rehearsals must 2022 my rehearsals must start in Vilnius but of course everyone understood what was happening on 24th of February 2022 our apartment is near Bucha in the Zhitomir, Zhitomirska Strasse or Zhitomirska Road so, and that was really quickly decision because we heard immediately everything and it was like, I, I come to my wife and say, okay, we have 45 minutes. And of course, it was funny situation when we're going to the border and then I calling to the airport and they say, no, no, we think everything will be fine. We will be flying now and other things. And I say, no, you can't fly because I mean, it's, air alarms and they are bombing, Russians are bombing Ukraine, so you can't, we can't go anywhere. And then um, my family goes out from Ukraine in two days, and then I had one month in Kiev, or in Lviv, sorry, and that was special experience because, I mean, I was, I'm from Odessa, I mean, in five years I start to live in Odessa, so I, I need to say that I'm from Odessa especially, and I'm Ukrainian who was born in other country. And then, uh, and then this one month in Lviv, it's something special because, I mean, in the third day of big war, every restaurant almost were working. And that is was really strange feeling of how everything is uh, another, like how, how we have another experience of war. And then in one month, I had a special permit from Minister of Culture that I can go out because in those moments, I was artistic director of Left Bank Theatre. And my idea, because I'm working in Europe from 2016 and from 2014, when this war was started, I totally understood that, I mean, world don't understand what is really happening. 
when I started to work in Germany, I mean, a lot of people were thinking, ah, you're from Ukraine? Oh, it's like a part of Russia or something like this. And it was, no, I mean, it's not a part of Russia. We are the country with our own history and other things. And that was like, okay, we need to explain what is happening because it's not some inside conflict or something like this, or conflict between West and East Ukraine or something like this. And all my works in Europe almost were based on the story of Ukraine, of our identification and what is really happening now in Ukraine. And then like, uh, that's why when everything like big war was started, a lot of people from Europe starting to write to me like, okay, what we want to do, what we need to do. I mean, uh, let's make some collaborations. We want to see your theater in our, I mean, 182 theaters from Europe supported us. Like they make a sign on the letter, which say, okay, you can show you, you can share your culture with us. And that was like, uh, okay, we need to go out because if we want to have a support and if we want to have a weapon from the West, they, the people in the audience need to understand like why we need it and not from the news. I mean, theater can't stop the war, theater can't give a weapon, but theater can give the experience from the people on the stage to the people in the audience. And that is what theater can do. Yes, it's a small step, like it's a step for 200 people or 500 people, but if we make it a lot, it can, it can give a result. And I, show it, and I saw it a lot in, in, in my life, how it's working. And then, yes, and then it was a big uh, tour of our theater across the Europe. It was more than 10 cities where people can, can, can watch performance uh, about our war. And then it starts uh, the project across almost Germany. It was Schaubühne Berlin, Kammerspiele Munich, uh, Düsseldorf Schauspielhaus, um, and uh, Mannheim National Theater and uh, Zurich Schauspielhaus in Switzerland. So that was my last season and uh, a new premieres in those theater. And in this season, everything is continuous because it's uh, Schaubühne one more time. Our premiere will be at the end of January. And then it will be Dusseldorf one more time and, um, and uh, Kammerspiele. And all these projects are about our war, and all this project is a combination of actors, so it's Germans and Ukrainians on a stage, and almostly mixed teams of um, our two countries. Um, yeah, and Stas, in one of the interviews, he told also a very interesting for me phrase that now there are a lot of artists who live in suitcases. And for me, it's something about Stas's experience, as I understood that you have to get permission every time for every other project to live abroad, right? Yeah, something like this. It's changed a little bit now because, I mean, uh, sometimes you totally don't have any time to go uh, to come back. And that is like, okay, it's like uh, projects here and projects there. And then you need to, because I don't have a position in Ukraine now, like artistic director. I lost it and it was my decision because, I mean... Um, Yes, yeah, sometimes uh, it's really hard to communicate with our Ministry of Culture and with Departments of Culture because you totally don't understand what they want to do and what they need to do. And sometimes when you when you start this dialogue between you and your German or Switzerland colleagues, they say, OK, what you need? And they ask to the ministry and they don't have any answers. So that's why sometimes these decisions like, OK, I need to do this one or these things. It's not because somebody tell me I need to do it. Like we organize the projects by ourselves. And of course, sometimes, yes, you need to communicate with the ministry. And that is and that is really hard, something which I can't understand, understand why we have such ministry in such cruel times and why we need to communicate with them in such a long, long way and hard way. And that is, that is, yeah, that is like it, it is. Sorry. <laughs> or like in Berlin. Uh, but one of the questions that also I wrote to you that I would like, do you have to go, uh, like, to 
have compromises when you're doing your projects, you with a group, uh, when you're working with the German institutions, for example, or they give you a complete freedom? I mean, it's totally complete freedom. I don't think that in German theater now you can have something not the freedom. I think the German theater is really free. And uh, that is a big opportunity that you don't have this really vertical system, which you almost every time have in Eastern Europe. You have totally horizontal system where you can say everything you want to say. And I mean, you saw the Schaubühne performance and it's not really, you know, all the questions which I have to my country, I always have in my shows. And it's not like propaganda style performances where Ukrainians are brave and good and Russians are bad. We need to explain to the world why. Of course, it's like this. Sorry. <laughs> but but, but we at need the to same time, human side. Yeah. Yes, yes, we need to explain. And that is like, and um, the show which you said, uh, which is going in Schaubühne, the moment is that all the stories are documentary. So the idea was that we need to speak about the persons which you know. So it's not like, okay, we take the stories from Facebook or take the stories from the people you never see. So it's the stories w with whom you can have a shake hands. So, and that was uh, the idea. And that's why it's really private show and something where you understand, okay, the, the people on a stage don't telling us the news or some, I don't know, social media shit. We are talk they are talking about uh, everything they knew from themselves. And that is, uh, I think, what can, which can be another, like, really another way to make, make performances now and really another experience for everyone who is in the show. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. The floor is yours. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, Stas. Ich denke, wir haben, wir haben von sechs Unbeugsamen gehört und Ungebeugten. We heard of six people who are invincible and now I would like to invite you to ask questions, but we'll have to keep it short because as a fourth segment we'll have a dance performance, but because we'll have to go back to the exhibition We'll then have to come back here again to drink wine and eat snacks, just for you to understand the logistics. But, um, you know, that was also supposed to give you the opportunity to ask questions. If you can't think of any questions now, but only after the dance performance. But now, you know, the question for you is if you in the audience have any questions for one of the people on stage or our three artists who are joining us virtually. If not, you can also think for a little bit, but I would just like to point out one more thing. Genia pointed out before this event is that we're here doing the Days of the Exile. That's what the series of events is called. And the artist that Evina chose speak about evacuation and not exile. And we just have to be aware that the nuances and the differences are very granular and there's a lot of pride involved as well and also the conviction of people who want to show maybe that they are that they refuse to surrender and this is why these days of the exile are so timely but at the same time you know this term is maybe now has become a little bit more clear this evening, but you already realized it right before when we talked about this event tonight. I have to wait for the translation, yeah. <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah, that we, we talked about it very briefly. I think, yeah, now I used the term exile because it's something that like we here agreed about. Uh, but... I actually don't remember, and maybe Ukrainian artists who, who are not present here now can say something about it also. I didn't hear that somebody from Ukraine used the term exile. It's more about evacuation. And if you think about it, yeah, maybe it's because exile, it's something that you forced to go into. and 
I see in a lot of Ukrainians that even in these circumstances, they prefer to think that they still have will and they still ha can decide. And for example, like Lena's example, she decided uh, no matter what, she had a good opportunities, good circumstances, but she decided to come back. And it's, yeah, it's a term that we don't like most probably, or we just didn't think about it, we didn't use it because we prefer to 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 keep on thinking that uh, there are a lot of decisions that we still can make. Yeah, I would like to also anschließen. I would like to I would like to add that um, with these three protagonists that I have presented to you, except Annie Albers, she was in the US and she found her freedom in her expression there. But Yuya Kerr and Valeska Gerd, they really wanted to go back. They really felt homesick and they had the feeling that their cultural roots are here, that they can express themselves the best here of what their visions are and what their ideas are. So for them, it was no question about staying or leaving. For them, that was a temporary exile. They always hoped for coming back one day. And I think we have so many famous examples in history. If we talk about Bertolt Brecht, who came back, or Thomas Mann, then they these cultural roots and the way of expressing yourself are very important criteria about it when you think about exile. And there's also this despair that you can see in Julia Kerr's suicide attempts or Stefan Zweig's story did accomplish his suicide in the end when he was in exile. And he also has lost his complete life, his, his basis, and he felt so desperate. This is something we should always consider, especially in this time of a very gruesome war, which is also very unnecessary. I would also like to thank the hosts here and the guests. I think every part, every um, story was interesting and insightful. One additional thing, yes. And that, uh, speaking about exile, uh, I pointed out during our previous conversation that, of course, we are talking like we are here from Odessa, from Kiev, from Dnipro, I don't know, and we really somehow we did have a choice and for example if we will talk about Mariupol then most probably we can speak about exile because that's that's exactly what it was um die dann sagung hast du mir sozusagen vorweggenommen martina ich wollte erst martina Martina, you've already started with the thanking the people. That's what I wanted to do as well, but it's it's all good. So there is a nuance between emigration, going into exile, being evacuated. These are all very emotional nuances. And cities in the Ukraine have been destroyed that much that you have to speak about exile. So. The three Ukrainian artists we have here on a Zoom call, I would like to ask them if there is uh, any expectation you have towards the German audience how to deal with this topic. Is there any idea, wish you have? Yes. Somehow. Oh, okay. Great. Тож це питання в першу чергу до вас. Чого ви очікуєте від німецької аудиторії? Як вона має комунікувати тему війни між Росією і Україною? 
um, maybe I can say only a few words from my experience, like it's experience of the theater audience. And of course, it's always a question like from what side you try to, to see this story. Of course, it's a point of view. Like, uh, and it's always a question, yes, but you know, that I mean, the most hardest question, of course, it's okay, what, how, how we need to deal with the liberal Russians who go out from, from Russia? Like we say in Ukraine, good Russians. And that's the main question, because I had a lot of requests like, OK, let's make a round table between you and some really liberal Russians. Uh, and you can speak really directly and from the bottom of your heart about everything. And that especially in Germany, because it's a, I mean, it's a long story of relationships between Germany and Russia. And of course, to, I mean, interrupt this dialogue, we need a little bit time to understand what is really, I mean, Russia. Because sometimes people are thinking, okay, that is Dostoevsky, I don't know, ballet and other things. But sorry, they didn't read their own books. That's the problem. And that's why when you speak about uh, liberal Russians, all my dialogues with them, I know some of them, ended with really imperial imperialistical things so for me my like um, opinion it's uh, we need to be in a dialogue with the audience and uh, i only wish trying to understand us from our perspective not from the perspective that we need to have a dialogue we can't have this dialogue we need a years after war to start Decades. the dialogue that's that's the point. After Gaga, after all the things, after uh, Reparati, I don't know how to say it in English, and all all the other things, and then maybe we can have the dialogue. So that's only my small request. And also, I might say that the cultural field is a very uh, like important in this case because it's very easy to cover something bad with a culture. And I remember now, Stas, you also posted this photo, I don't know if you saw it, when uh, the drama theater in Mariupol was destroyed and then at some point of the time, they covered it with something like a curtains, I don't know the word for it. Uh, and the famous Russian cultural figures were painted over these curtains. And that's such a, such a, great, let's say so, example about how you can cover your crimes with culture. Ich muss einmal mehr den sehr undankbaren Part derjenigen übernehmen, die auf die Uhr schauen. I need to take over this very ungrateful part of the person who has to look at the clock, because we still have a dance performance and we want to respect the dancer too. We owe her that, as we owe the respect to everyone. And I would love to thank you all three for your open words and for your input. I would like to thank the two people on stage with me and also thank the people in the back for the technical masterpiece that you have put up here, which is even multilingual, which you might not see, but it is happening in the background. I would like to invite you to come over to the other room and we will have your introduction and then you might come back to get some drinks and some food. And you can also ask your question to us or to Virginia. Thank you very much.